We, we had a lot of people die in our arms in the beginning because we, had, we were operating on a kitchen table doing amputations. I remember my thoughts at that time was, what did you really get yourself into this time? Well, when I uh, first came to Miami, I was doing uh, the equivalent of medical missions uh, in South America, in Ecuador, and Colombia, and other countries. And I always felt empty when I left. I, I got a lot done. I did surgeries. I did training and education. But when I left there, I felt like I was empty because I felt that my presence there was just temporary. Usually medical missions went down there. People would get their picture taken, they'd wear the t-shirt, they'd feel real good, but when they left a week later, the country was no better off than it was when they came. And that's the mistake that a lot of people make who mean well, but don't realize that what a developing nation needs is not these type of visits, these medical tourism, but rather they need organizations and people that are willing to commit long term to changing the way they are and the opportunities they have. And so the same thing happened in Haiti. 20 years ago I was brought by a, a faith-based group, a good friends of mine, on a medical mission. We saw over a thousand patients in a week and I, I just was overwhelmed with the dignity and stoicism and optimism of, of the Haitian people, their spirituality. I said, oh my gosh, it's two hours from Miami and the main cause of death is dirty water and malnutrition. I thought, how can that be? And that I've got to do something personally to change their opportunities. Well, in the first few years, we mainly took group, large groups of students and, and professors, faculty, physicians, nurses, allied health professionals into areas of Haiti especially in the isolated central plateau that were underserved and we did clinics that would serve thousands of people in a week with our big team but it became increasingly apparent it was a bad lesson for our students because we're the ones that came back feeling so good about what we did and what we accomplished but a month after we left there I was convinced that they would be even worse off because they had all these medicines and, and all these treatments that couldn't be sustained, they couldn't be continued. We dropped the blood pressure of thousands of people that were in hypertensive crisis, but they'd run out of pills in a month or two, and they'd die of a stroke from you know, a reaction to loss in the medicine. So we had to rethink what we were doing. We had to think about the long-term effect of everything we did, and that's why we decided to create Project MediShare. we decided that we wanted to create an organization that would be different. It would be an organization that didn't have an agenda except to serve the people of Haiti, but that we wouldn't be medical missionaries. Instead, we would only do projects that would be uh, sustainable in the long term. We realized that the cause of malaria, TB, typhoid fever, dengue fever, starvation, all the things that we were fighting was poverty. It wasn't the mosquito, it wasn't the cholera bacteria, it was poverty. So we began a new approach and to our health program, our public health and community health, we added community development, all of the goals that are necessary. Everything from education and clean water for irrigation and potable water 
and, and microfinance and, and industry, agriculture and rural areas, which is where we were. Um, all the different development areas, maternal and, and childhood issues, good housing, sanitation. Unless you have a multi-sector development program, health is, is, is spitting in the wind. It's got to be part of a holistic approach. We've created communities in Haiti with all of these different factors and it's successful. And they're going to be the healthiest long term because they can afford to buy the medicines they need, get the medical care they need, send their kids to school. So this is why community development is just as important as health. We're following this earthquake in Haiti, a 7.0 magnitude. Uh, and joining us, we're following the breaking news out of Haiti, the largest, most powerful... The 7.0 quake was centered roughly 10 miles from the capital city, Port-au-Prince. Well, I was in Miami working at Jackson Hospital at UM, where I work, and suddenly, you know, I received this call, and first thing I did is got on the phone and started trying to find a plane to get down there. Dr. Green called me up while I was on call and asked me if I could help him with uh, gathering some equipment to go down to Haiti and, uh, and would I be willing to go down with him. The next morning, myself and a team of critical care doctors were on a plane headed for Port-au-Prince. We weren't allowed to fly there, so we, we charted a course to the DR and then we had to you know, sort of coerce our pilot you know, in this private plane to land because there were no planes on the ground. We were the first medical people to arrive. We found out while we were on the plane that there was absolutely no tower control and there was no control flying into the country. So it was like, what am I doing on this plane risking my life? And the second we landed, we just walked across the runway into the UN headquarters, which had been the, their tent, their meeting tent, had turned into a hospital with no doctors, no nurses, no medicines, no supplies. As we walked into these tents, we were basically met by foul uh, stench of uh, dead tissue, uh, urine, um, and hundreds of people in each of the two tents. Uh, laying there uh, with lots of noise, crying babies, people that were moaning. And I remember my thoughts at that time was, what did you really get yourself into this time? It became apparent that this wasn't going to be enough and that it was inhumane. It was a carnage. It was, it was beyond my, my possible imagination to think that this could happen to human beings. We, we had a lot of people die in our arms in the beginning because we, had, we were operating on a kitchen table doing amputations. We had a courageous team with us, but it became apparent that this wasn't going to be enough and that it was inhumane. It was a carnage. It was, it was beyond my, my possible imagination to think that this could happen to human beings. So what we did was we called Miami and the University of Miami and Jackson Hospital, our medical center, the Children's Hospital, the Colette and Broward and Dade, a, a massive mobilization occurred. What, remember you said you had like storage space? This yeah, building, the Miami space. Project, which is a research center, turned into an operations headquarters. And we had 100 people here 24 hours a day just coordinating the massive airlifts. We had planes back and forth, planes every day full of doctors and nurses, supplies. The tents that were on Miami Beach for events suddenly found them where, their way to Haiti. We created the largest hospital in Haiti. It was a 300-bed critical care hospital that was you know, air-conditioned and had ICUs and operating rooms and huge supply areas and places for the 5,000 doctors and nurses we flew down there. We had two 737s every week going back and forth with doctors and nurses and medical volunteers to sustain this massive effort. 
it's hard, it's hard, it's all my do our doctors are in tears. Within an hour, they're in tears. That's all I can tell you. And these guys work in Ryder Trauma, the busiest trauma center in America, where they train the U.S. troops. But everybody wants to, wants to help. We just have to coordinate our efforts. And it can't be next week. It has to be quickly. There wasn't a day I didn't cry in the first couple of weeks. I'm an old dude. I don't cry much. But just the tremendous carnage and all the wonderful response to it was just overwhelming. I mean, it was just an emotional experience that, that few people are privileged to ever have had. And I feel so privileged that I was there and able to participate. This is our Hospital Bernard Mev Project MediShare, located in the Village Solidarity in the heart of Port-au-Prince. This is a 45-bed facility. On a daily basis, we probably see 300 patients at our outpatient clinic, and we receive emergencies such as gunshot wounds, heart attacks, strokes, motorcycle accidents, car accidents, any sort of critical urgent care that is needed. We're the sole provider here in Port-au-Prince. The hospital has uh, multiple departments. It has a emergency room, the OR, an outpatient clinic, a spinal cord unit, critical care, intensive care unit. We have the pediatric uh, ward, a neonatal intensive care unit, a laboratory, which is becoming, as we speak, even more sophisticated, and the rehab orthotics and prosthetics program. We've got quite an extensive group. In the last 20 years where I've visited Haiti dozens and dozens of times, every time I've done a clinic, I've seen amputees there. They don't even have crutches. They basically drag their bodies across the ground. Sometimes they have a bag under it or a piece of canvas to keep their skin from coming off, but they, they have no wheelchairs, they had no, no real crutches, and they were considered outcasts by the community because of this. And uh, what happened in the earthquake is thousands of people, many of them children, suffered crush injuries and had amputations. And we knew that if we didn't intervene and do something, that these people would become outcasts and they would really, most of them would die of complications because of infections and all the things that occur and surely they would never get up and walk. Today, um, you know, because of the holidays, because of the political situation, we've had kind of a backlog of vacations, etc. We've had a backlog of uh, patients, and uh, today is actually the, the reopening of uh, our clinic. And as you can see, we've got quite a few patients here today to, to have their uh, adjustments made, to be uh, assessed by uh, our prosthetist, DeVore, and uh, to hopefully be fit. We do have a few um, uh, sockets here ready to be put on, and so we're uh, anxious to get started. Maybe. Maybe. If you go into any major city, uh, you will find that for orthotics and prosthetics, there are only a limited amount of specialists who really know how to deal with these type of problems. But let alone in Haiti, uh, up to now, there were no trained orthotics or prosthetics uh, doctors and technicians that are able to deal with amputations. So the value of having and creating a orthotics and prosthetics lab is absolutely invaluable. This patient, uh, Nisa, was an earthquake victim, and uh, this is uh, his first fitting after we received his prosthetic. Um, and so today will be his first, first time standing on two legs. The average amputee child in Haiti will need three legs every year because as they grow, they outgrow these legs. And if they didn't have these legs, they'd be dragging along the ground. The same technology telemedicine that we use to make rounds in the ICU and to advise in the operating room in Haiti, we're doing the same thing with the prosthetics. We use modern communications 
to be able to, to send off the information, to fashion the legs. They're culturally sensitive. They're black legs, you know, that fit on, on the bodies and they look natural. And before, nothing like that was available in Haiti. I'm just a facilitator for this team, uh, the Project MetaShares RN. The, the team logo um, and name was actually chosen, uh, chose by uh, the, the, the players themselves, so uh, they wanted to be known as the Tarantulas. A leg is worthless without training, without peer counseling, without the psychosocial parts of an, being an amputee. It's no different in Haiti, just because they're poor. Wilfred was injured in the earthquake. Um, he was at work, he's a welder beforehand, and uh, a wall fell on his leg, breaking his leg. For me, the first one was to break my leg, I was going to get to the hospital and I was going to get to the hospital. Before I went to the hospital, I was going to get to the hospital. He was actually one of our first patients at our tent hospital. Um, we assessed him and knew right off the bat he deserved a prosthetic immediately. As soon as he was healed, uh, we, we fit him with his prosthetic. And literally within five minutes he was walking as an above knee, which is impressive. More impressive was the next morning he was kicking a soccer ball. I was able to find a prosthetic for me. I was able to find a prosthetic for me. I was able to find a prosthetic for me. He wanted to start this soccer team and he uh, brought in his other friends who are amputees. We have 23 players on the team. Of them, 17 are ampu uh, amputees as a direct result of the earthquake. It wasn't enough for Wilford to come in for a, a bandit change. He had to translate for others. He had to make sure that everybody was well taken care of. Before long, you know, we decided that we couldn't live without Wilfred. He exemplified the hope and the resilience that the Haitian people exhibit. And um, he has been a great role model for all of our prosthetic patients. Yeah, this exemplifies what Project MediShare is about. We are here today watching our patients that we fitted with prosthetics that were injured during the earthquake that are out there playing soccer. It's what we stand for, for hope, for education, for people bettering themselves. The soccer team uh, exemplifies the, the spirituality of the Haitian nation, the people. The people are amazing. And the spirit of those people is what made that game so exciting. Because they're not saying, oh, why me, or why did this happen? These people were lying in my tent after we cut off their legs on a kitchen table without anesthetic and thanking us. And for sure, those type of people deserve the opportunity to have a life in the future, to have families, and to be medically sound and safe, and to compete, whether it's with jobs, education, or sports. He's such a, a great guy. Uh, we hired him on to be a prosthetic techs. Um, in addition to that, we're, we've uh, been given the technology to make our own prosthetic knees, liners, everything here. So um, over two years, we're going to be training them how to do these things. And whenever we leave, it's their job. It's their lab. They're able to make everything, sell it. It's, it's, their, it's their profession, patients treating Haitians. Project MediShare believes in 
building capacity and creating sustainability here in Haiti. And, you know, as you know, we have 150 Haitians employed at our hospital. I've been with Project Medishare for about five years now. Our goal here is to actually have the whole hospital staffed by Haitian. It's been a very painful year. Um, we've lost a lot of people, and hopefully we can create a better, sustainable place for the Haitian people. Our role isn't to be occupiers. Our role is to be expediters and to be mentors. And that's what we've done in our hospital. We have hundreds of Haitian employees now. Before it was all American volunteers. Now the American doctors and nurses are teaching their mentors and they're standing right alongside Haitian doctors and nurses. That's what has to happen in Haiti because we, we don't need to be there forever. We have to be there long enough to empower them to create their own fate and their own future. We're following this earthquake in Haiti, a 7.0 magnitude, uh, in uh, uh, only about 10 or so miles from the capital of Port-au-Prince. The strongest earthquake to hit the country in over 200 years. Bon Dieu connaît ça la fête, même le nous.